talking about discovery, delivery, systems. I'm going to talk about Ebola, and I should start by saying if you're a doctor who just returned from Liberia who is working on Ebola, you should clarify in the state of New York on this very political day next to Bellevue Hospital that it was greater than 21 days ago. So <laughs> I am safe. But I, I do, on a more serious note, want to first of all talk about leadership in this crisis. I'm a physician. I have been privileged to work with a group called Last Mile Health, as Riz said. We are an organization, a nonprofit based out of Boston, also working in my home country of Liberia, that focuses on creating a new workforce to save lives in the world's most remote villages. This is where a billion people on this planet, as you all know and have tried to work with as well, don't have any physical access to care. And we bridge that gap by giving village health workers a new face. We put village health workers on steroids. We make them better. <laughs> we give them the equipment, the training, the coaching, and the employment that they need to perform like real medical professionals. We're going to talk about Ebola first. How many here see the news and feel despair when they see it? Or how many people know others that feel despair when they see the news? Almost 15,000 infections that are known, almost 5,000 deaths in the three most affected countries. And the epidemic is raging. We've seen some positive signs in a few areas, but the epidemic is raging. I, the rainforest of Liberia, where we work, over 100 infections, 60 deaths. Most of those, over 60% of those, have happened in the last three to four weeks. Why has this happened? To really understand the epidemic and the solutions to it, you have to look back in the history of Liberia and at health systems. And it's very personal for me. I, I actually, uh, while I don't look at, I am um, one of those few rare species called brown Africans. And I, my parents immigrated from India to Liberia and had the privilege, the privilege of being born in Liberia, in Monrovia. It's an amazing place to live. Believe it or not, people from Ghana, people from Nigeria used to come to our country to get health care. And then in 1990, when I was nine years old, civil war erupted. The rebels started their onslaught in the countryside, within weeks entered our town, cut off the main airport, and one morning my mom knocked on the door and said, Raj, pack your things, we have to go. We rushed in the center of town, and there on the tarmac, we were split into two lines. One line, my mother, sister, and I stood. We were thrown into the back of a cargo relief plane. And across from us stood hundreds of poor Liberians, rural Liberians, children strapped to their backs. They try to jump in the hatch with us, and what I witnessed was soldiers restraining them. We left those people on the tarmac behind. And that is a metaphor, a metaphor for this moment now. There are so many Americans that have been evacuated from this crisis. I'm an American now. All of them have survived. And yet, the death rate for Ebola in my, in my country and others is 70%. I will argue that the most important sector that could make a difference in this fight is the private sector. The most important sector that can make a difference in this fight right now is the pharmaceutical sector. The most important people that can make a difference in this fight right now is you all. In the history of Ebola, modern medicine has never collided with this disease. Modern medicine has never collided with Ebola. And we know what happens when modern medicine, modern technology collides with epidemics that we believe are fatalistic. HIV is an example. Many of you have worked on that. The death rate is no longer what it was. It's much less. We can bring the death rate down from 70% to less than 20% to less than 10% with the right vaccines, the right therapeutics, the right testing in those settings. I was one of the lucky ones. I had a chance to get evacuated to North Carolina, had a chance to rebuild my life. My dad got a job as a clothing salesperson. I went over to North Carolina, UNC, got a medical degree, and had a chance to go back home a decade ago. Exciting time, revival, 15 years of conflict, and we had a Nobel Peace Prize winner as our president, first female president in Africa. And when I got home, what I saw was utter destruction. The war left us with just 51 doctors to serve 4 million people. That would be like Manhattan having eight for the entire city. So imagine if you got sick in a city where those doctors, few doctors were, you might stand a chance. 
But if you got sick in the remote villages, you would die anonymously. And that's what we see with Ebola now. The epidemic did not start in February, March. The epidemic started almost a year ago in December of 2013 in a small remote village in southern Guinea where a little two-year-old boy got infected who is thought to be the first case, patient zero as he's called in the epidemic, when the disease jumped from animals to humans. He died in December of fever, vomiting, diarrhea, bleeding. His mother dies a few weeks later. His sisters die a few weeks after that. His village midwife dies a few weeks after that. And it isn't until the end of February when someone finally gets one of the poor people in his village over to the hospital where they finally diagnose that this is Ebola. And that by then it had spread to three countries. It had taken already too many lives. That's the challenge of not just that little boy. There's a billion people on this planet who live in the world's most remote villages who by virtue of living too far from the nearest clinic do not have access to care. What's the answer? There are a lot of answers. More doctors are needed, more nurses are needed, more clinics are needed, all of that's true. One answer that's been out there for a while is the idea of village health workers. The idea that you could take a local layperson, train them for a few days, give them some education, and go out and they could solve a problem. That idea has so far failed. We know that because they don't exist in these last mile remote villages, and when they do, you get the kind of situations where they're treated like amateurs. Take a woman named Zakba, for instance, from a village that I work in, in Liberia. 17 hours from the capital, eight hours walk from the, two days walk from the nearest clinic, she, the typical approach to recruiting a woman like her is to ask the village chief to nominate her, never check if she's qualified. You send her in for training. She gets one or two days of training. She gets sent back educating on one or two diseases, maybe somehow managing one or two diseases, never equipped, not coached, and often not paid. We treat a woman like Zakba like an amateur and we expect professional results. We don't treat ourselves like that on our jobs. We want to be treated like professionals. And so Last Mile Health, with the Ministry of Health in Liberia, created a model that said, could we take the entire value chain, how you not what the community health worker does, but how they get supported to do it, how they're recruited, trained, equipped, supplied, coached, and paid. And could you make each step more efficient, more effective? Take a workforce approach, a private sector approach to it. Could you get better performing workers? So we took Zakba, we ran it through the ringer. She had to take four tests, a literacy test, all the way to probation period. She ran through training that lasted not just a couple of weeks, but 28 weeks. She, got, she learned how to tackle the top 10 killers of, of her community, from malaria to HIV, now Ebola, to cr chronic diseases. We gave her a backpack full of equipment, made sure the stock in her backpack never ran out, gave her a coach, a nurse, rides 50 miles a week in the jungle just to coach her on the job, the kind of training I got in medical school, on the job training. And then we gave her a contract, held her accountable for making sure all the kids in her village were immunized, all the HIV patients were actually getting treatment and adhering to treatment, all the tuberculosis patients and the patients with high blood pressure were getting screened appropriately with the right equipment. We did that over and over again in the most remote village in, in Liberia. Uh, somebody put up a slide about medieval period. In this area, Konobo, 17 hours from the capital, area the size of Rhode Island, 42 villages, the average age of death two years ago was equivalent to the death rate in medieval Europe during the plague. It was 28.6 years. And in the last two years, we've been working with the government to implement this model of professionalized community health workers. And we've taken an immunization coverage rate that was 11% up to 81%. We've taken a prenatal care coverage rate that was down at 20% up to 97%. For the first time ever, people have access to hypertension screening with blood pressure cuffs done by community health workers, access to antihypertensives, HIV medicines, tuberculosis medicines, and now access to treatment for Ebola services. We are facing a major challenge, and I want to invite your leadership to help us fight back against Ebola. We've been asked by the government to help it scale this idea to 23,000 community professionalized health workers in the entire country to cover every woman, man, and child so that you get health care no matter where you live, no matter who you are. That's going to take a lot to get done, both financial resources, which some of you have already committed to the three countries. It's going to take equipment and product. And it's going to take the kind of private sector leadership and accountability that you all bring. 
I'd love to talk more about that during the Q&A, and I'll end by saying we all know illness is universal, access to care is not. But we all know we can change that. We've done it because of you all for HIV. We are doing it for tuberculosis. We're doing it for chronic diseases. We can do it for Ebola, despite what the headlines say. We know the trends can be different. And I believe we can start doing that right here in this room. So I want to thank you for your time and for having me. We'll see if, uh, in the, the couple of minutes we've got, Roger, if we can get a couple of questions in. If, if anyone wants to put their hand up, we'll get a microphone to you. Sure. Anyone? Let me just ask you, in terms of the scalability of this, this project, um, what kind of resources do you need to make it, I mean, significantly scalable? So um, in the short term, $5 million would help us get 400 workers and help, the go help us help the government uh, scale up to 23,000 workers. They ha they're having resources come in. So that's the short answer for the immediate term. The long term is that each one of these workers, to pay them, costs $80 a month. Imagine if we'd spent tens of millions of dollars to get a worker like this in every village, including where that two-year-old boy was in Southern Guinea, we wouldn't be spending the billions of dollars we're spending now on this crisis. The cost of inaction is more than the cost of action. So that's, that's really the answer. The irony is that it sounds like uh, you've got a, it's got a proven track record. You can see the effect. But it seems that getting uh, the, the right kind of players to engage is a challenge. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of commitment from government and the international uh, funders uh, and private philanthropy. Uh, the, the, our, uh, the most effective partnerships, I think, have been with the corporate sector. And I know many here will work on Ebola vaccines. If you need help working on how to sensitize a community to make sure that that vaccine can be delivered. Um, if you actually need to get the vaccines out there and make sure they stay out there. These are types of partnerships, diagnostic tests. So when you were coming here, who in, in the audience here, in the participant group here, did you think would be your target kind of angel? Oh, <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I think anyone involved in, in diagnostic testing, uh, especially rapid tests that can fit into a backpack, point of care testing, anyone with um, uh, ability and product on medicines for the top 10 killers. Uh, who want to team up with a group that does efficient delivery and ties delivery to discovery. We work very closely with Harvard to do research. Those would be the folks that I think would make the most ideal partners. Well, hopefully when everyone filters the hotspots a little while, you can pin someone down. Sure. Raj, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.